Greetings, folks. Welcome back to a city full of history. My name is Dan Thurber. I am your analyzing, scrutinizing, video making, history relating, storytelling, coding, and uploading son of a gun. Woo! And today, well, before we get into things, a little bit of backstory first. You see, a few years ago, I was looking for a copy of a book. The book was called Song of the Sky by a fellow named Guy Murchie. It's a fantastic book. If you have any interest in aviation history or navigation history or anything like that, or you just really want good books, check it out. Guy Murchie's a fantastic writer. Added to that, he did all of the art for the book. If I could find the end papers of this book in poster format, I would hang them on my wall in a second. Seriously, check this out. So as I was looking for a copy of Song of the Sky, I came across another book, one called The Three Musketeers of the Air. That was written by Captain Herman Cole, Major James Fitzmorris, and Baron Gunther von Hünfeld. And I don't know if it was because the book was only a couple of bucks, if it was because way back in the day, The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas, the book that really got me into literature to begin with, or if I was just intrigued at the idea that a book was written by a captain, a major, and a baron all at the same time. But either way, I picked it up. Inside was the account of the Bremen, as told from each of these three men's points of view. The Bremen was the first airplane to fly non-stop from East Europe to West North America. See, prior to the Bremen, all of the non-stop transatlantic flights had been from West North America to East Europe. And there was a reason for that. It was easier. You see, if you're going from North America to Europe, you have a prevailing tailwind. The wind pushes you along, which means that the airplane doesn't need a range as long or fuel capacity as great as you would need if you were going from Europe against that headwind towards North America. Which is why, even almost a year after Lindbergh won the Ortigue Prize, no one had been able to do it non-stop going from Europe to North America. Then came the Bremen. We're getting out of the library and onto the street. It really is a city full of history. You just have to go out and find it. Hermann Kohl was born in Neuwilm, Bavarian Swabia, on April 15, 1888. He enrolled in military school, and upon the breakout of World War I, was part of an engineering unit. During a charge in which his unit was at the front to remove any obstructions to marching, he was shot in the left shin bone, rendering him unfit for service with foot troops, a blessing in disguise, as he would later write, It turned out happily for me, because it enabled me to fulfill my warmest wish. As I was temporarily unfit for foot troop service, I reported myself in order to be able to return immediately to the front to the Aviation Corps, which was just beginning to get going in those days. He flew for several years, earning promotion to captain. On May 21, 1918, he was shot down over France and subsequently captured. He spent 16 months in a French POW camp before escaping and making his way back to Germany. After the war, he would go to work for Lufthansa as the head of their night fly. Through his contacts at Lufthansa, he met Baron von Hünfeld. Baron Gunther von Hünfeld was born in Königsberg, East Prussia on May 1, 1892. His early life was marked by numerous health issues, including partial blindness as well as kidney and heart problems. As a result, he was never able to receive a pilot's license, but he wouldn't let that keep him away from aviation. He was seriously wounded early in the war, necessitating a reassignment to diplomatic work. After the armistice, he went to work for Neudeutsche Lloyd, a German shipping company. During this time, his imagination was captured by the transatlantic aviation exploits of John Alcock and Arthur Brown, Clarence Chamberlain, and of course, Charles Lindbergh. The idea to go from east to west, the more difficult direction, was planted in his brain, and despite his maladies, he felt himself equal to the task. He organized the chartering of a pair of Junkers W-33 aircraft, naming them the Bremen and the Europa. Unable to fly the aircraft himself, he was put in touch with Hermann Kohl at Lufthansa on account of Kohl's experience with night flying. The two aircraft attempted the east-west crossing in August 1927, with Kohl, von Hünfeld, and Fritz Luce, another pilot from Junkers, crewing the Bremen. 
Shortly after departing Germany, the Europa encountered a storm and turned back, becoming damaged in the forced landing. The Bremen carried on, but eventually had to turn back as well due to weather. In the coming months, von Hunfeld would purchase the Bremen himself, and he and Cole began planning their next attempt for the following spring. They decided this time to start from Baldonnell Field, an Irish aerodrome just west of Dublin. It was there that they met James Fitzmorris. James Fitzmorris was born in Dublin on January 6, 1898. With the outbreak of World War I, he enlisted in the 17th Lancers, a regiment of British cavalry. In 1918, the War Office put out a call for soldiers to enroll in the Royal Flying Corps, and Fitzmorris stepped forward. He completed training in the fall and was due to sail for France on November 11, 1918, the day the armistice was signed. Following the war, he resigned his place with the Royal Air Force and took a commission with the new Irish Free State Army Air Corps, following the establishment of the Irish Free State. In 1925, Fitzmorris was promoted to the rank of Commandant, based at Baldonnell Aerodrome, and in 1926 was appointed to the command of the Corps. He would make an east-to-west attempt in September 1927 in a Fokker named the Princess Zenia, but would abandon the flight due to poor weather. On March 26, 1928, a Junkers W-33, named Bremen, landed at Baldonnell, crewed by two German aviators, intent on making an Atlantic crossing departing from Baldonnell. Owing to his experience and similar desire to see such a flight completed, Cole and von Hunfeld asked if Fitzmorris would join the Bremen as their second pilot. Viewing the flight as important not only for its potential to make history, but also because it illustrated how people previously from opposite sides of a war could later make peace, he accepted. Even before they took off from Baldonnell, New Yorkers had whipped themselves into a frenzy over the arrival of the Bremen. Thousands went out to Mitchell Fields on Long Island to greet the aviation pioneers as they arrived on April 13th, including New York City Mayor Jimmy Walker. The hours ticked by, even surpassing the estimated 45 hours worth of fuel that the Bremen was supposed to have on board. The Bremen never arrived. The first day of the flight went by well enough. The weather held, and aside from a few minor hiccups, the airplane was in fine shape. As the Bremen flew into the night, the weather took a turn for the worse. Fog rolled in, as well as snow and sleet. Still, the crew carried on with Cole and Fitzmorris trading shifts at the controls. The crew began to suspect that their magnetic compass was becoming more and more unreliable, something which was confirmed with every sighting the aviators had of the North Star. As dawn broke, the Bremen crew found themselves over land, dense forest and imposing mountains. Fitzmorris surmised they must be somewhere deep in Labrador, and with their fuel getting low, Cole steered southeast, hoping to pick up the coastline. The weather was far from ideal, with strong winds and low visibility complicating the plan. The Bremen flew on, her fuel level getting ever lower. Unsure of exactly where they were and with their supply of fuel nearly out, the crew decided it would be best to try and land. But the terrain they were flying over when they actually saw it through the fog was rocky and inhospitable, so they continued on hoping to pick up the coastline. Eventually, Fitzmorris spied something that looked like the bow of a ship sticking up out of the fog. It turned out to be a lighthouse, so it was there they decided to try their luck. The area the lighthouse sat on was also incredibly rocky, very inhospitable, and really rough terrain to try and make a landing on. However, there was a frozen reservoir, bog, lake, it's described differently, on the island. Nice, smooth ice, so it was on that spot that Cole tried his luck. He made what Fitzmorris wrote was a perfect three-point landing. Unfortunately, the ice had already started to weaken in the spring thaw, and as the Bremen slowed to a stop, the nose of the aircraft went through the ice, making what von Hunfeld wrote was the Bremen's courtesy bow. The lighthouse keeper's family, the only occupants on this rough speck of terrain, came out to welcome the crew, very surprised that they had come from Europe just as much as the crew was surprised to find themselves on Greenlee Island, a small speck of land in the Belle Isle Strait in between Labrador and Newfoundland. They had made it. It was hardly the North American destination they had in mind when they set out, but Ultimately, the crew of the Bremen would go down in history as having completed the first east-to-west transatlantic non-stop flight in history. 
As for the crew themselves, they were shaken by their ordeal, but otherwise none the worse for wear, and the lighthouse keeper's family, the Latampiers, took excellent care of them in the 10 days that they spent on Greenlee Island. Those 10 days were occupied in getting word back to the outside world that they had survived their ordeal and that they were safe, as well as trying to repair the Bremen. See, the original plan was to repair the aircraft and still continue to fly it onto New York, but it quickly became apparent that the Bremen required more extensive repairs than could be done in such a remote outpost on such short notice. Ultimately, the crew decided to abandon the Bremen on Greenlee Island and continue on to New York. New Yorkers went nuts over the crew of the Bremen, and the festivities lasted for days. They were subject of one of the largest ticker tape parades New Yorkers had ever thrown anybody. They came here to Federal Hall and laid wreaths at the feet of the George Washington statue. They made speeches, there was merchandise, songs were written, including one called Skybirds, which was written by August Cole, Captain Cole's uncle. August had emigrated some years prior and was a band leader, musician, and composer based in New York City. He was delighted that his nephew had made the trip all the way just to see him. One notable incident that occurred throughout all of this fanfare was the fact that the Bremen crew was brought up to the Bronx to visit Yankee Stadium. They led a small parade around the field and then settled in to watch the 1928 Yankees, which included Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, whip up on the Chicago White Sox, 4-2. It was their first ever baseball game. They then set out on a grand tour of several major cities, including visiting Washington, D.C., where they met Charles Lindbergh, and President Calvin Coolidge bestowed the Distinguished Flying Cross on each of the Bremen's crew. Following their American tour, they returned to New York, remaining in seclusion for several days to finish their book, published in late 1928, titled the Three Musketeers of the Air. Less than a year later, Baron Gunther von Hünfeld's lifelong health problems finally caught up with him. He passed away on February 5th, 1929. He was 36 years old. Shortly before he passed, he presented the Bremen to the people of New York City through the Museum of the City of New York as thanks for the warm reception he and his crew received here. It was shipped from Greenlee Isle back to Germany where it was restored before arriving in New York in May of 1929. It was hung over the east balcony of Grand Central Terminal as part of an exhibition on transportation put together by the New York Central Railroad. It was unveiled by James Fitzmaurice. Herman Cole, the effable, lovable captain of the Bremen, would only survive another decade after the famous flight he lost his job with Lufthansa over his decision not to throw in with the Nazis. He retired to the country, passing away in Munich on October 8, 1938. After the fanfare surrounding the Bremen flight died down, James Fitzmaurice returned to the Irish Air Corps, resigning as a colonel in 1929 to pursue other ventures. He passed away on September 26, 1965, at the age of 68. For as big a deal as the Bremen was back in 1928, nowadays New York has almost entirely forgotten about it, and no trace of the famous flight can be found, except for one spot. Now this stretch of Broadway here between Bowling Green and City Hall is today referred to as the Canyon of Heroes. The reason for that designation is because back in 2000, all of the sidewalks were being replaced, and the Alliance for Downtown Broadway thought it would be a nifty idea if, when the new sidewalks were installed, they put granite markers in between the panels to commemorate every time New York had thrown a ticker tape parade. As a result, you can come down to the east side of Broadway, just opposite the Raging Bull behind me there, and you can see a marker from April 30th, 1928, for Captain Herman Cole, Major James Fitzmaurice, and Baron Gunther von Hutenfeld for the flight of the Bremen.